Good evening. We want to thank you for joining us tonight for this year's Martin Luther King Jr. commemoration at Cornell. The King commemoration on campus is a public campus-based forum that seeks to make accessible the life and legacy of Dr. King for contemporary times. We celebrate Dr. King's life and legacy in February because spring semester classes begin typically during the week the actual federal King holiday occurs. But we also have the impetus to hold it under those, within those circumstances during what we recognize as Black History Month. Hence, this February cele celebration or opportunity provides us an occasion to acknowledge King's grounding in the African-American experience, his significant contribution to the ongoing struggle for racial justice, and the manner in which that struggle was linked to global struggles for peace and economic justice, and the way in which the struggle in which he played such a significant role also helped to inspire movements for free speech, women's rights, gay rights, the contemporary interfaith youth movement, and human rights efforts worldwide, even to this day. Tonight's speaker is linked to the King legacy, as his grandfather was a significant influence on Dr. King's use of nonviolent direct action in the black freedom struggle of the 1960s, and Dr. King's commitment to nonviolence as a philosophy of life not simply a tactic to be used in a social struggle, in a struggle for social change, after his visit to India in 1959. Few names in world history evoke powerful images of integrity, courage, social harmony, and hope as the name Gandhi. Arun Gandhi was born in apartheid-era South Africa, when at the age of 12, he was sent by his parents to stay with his grandfather, the legendary spiritual leader and leader of India's liberation, Mahatma K. Gandhi. During a turbulent period in India's struggle for independence, what followed was an 18-month stay with one of the world's great leaders. Viewing firsthand the effects of his grandfather's national campaign for liberation through nonviolent means, the foundation for Arun's life work was shaped. It was a dangerous and exciting time as Mahatma Gandhi was leading the people of India in their revolutionary nonviolent struggle for independence from British rule. After leading successful projects for economic and social reform in India, Arun came to the United States in 1987 to complete research for a comparative study on racism in America. In 1991, Arun and his late wife, Sunanda, founded the M.K. Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence, now headquartered at the University of Rochester in Rochester, New York. The Institute's goal to foster an understanding of nonviolence is taught by Arun's grandfather has become a reality through workshops, lectures, and community outreach programs. Tonight, Mr. Gandhi will explore the interrelated issues of nonviolence, social justice, and food security in light of the legacy of Martin Luther King, Jr. Please join me in welcoming Arun Gandhi. Thank you very much. The last time I was here in this chapel three years ago was when my grandson got married here. We had a Hindu ceremony and a Christian ceremony because he married an American Christian girl and it was a wonderful experience. But I'm very happy to be here this evening and to share with you and my understanding of the philosophy of nonviolence. The topic that has been chosen for discussion today is very important and very broad. But I think we can understand 
social justice and hunger and poverty and <coughs> destitution in society only if we understand the philosophy of nonviolence. And my uh, experience has been that uh, what we know about nonviolence is just a fraction of the philosophy. The depth of the philosophy still needs to be uh, discovered. And I'm going to try to share with you some of the deeper understandings of this philosophy that I was able to gather from my grandfather when I lived with him between the age of 12 and 14, and many things that I learned from my parents as I grew up with them, because they believed in the philosophy of nonviolence and practiced it at home. One of the first things that I was taught by my grandfather when I came to him from South Africa, because I was a victim of prejudices. I was beaten up uh, by whites when I was about 10 years old because of the color of my skin. And then a few months later, I was beaten up by blacks. And both the times because they didn't like the color of my skin. And I was full of rage. I wanted eye for an eye justice. And it became such an obsession with me that I started going to the gymnasium and pump, pumping iron and doing exercise so that I could be strong and fight back again. And that is when my parents decided to take me to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather and hopefully learn something from him. So one of the first lessons that grandfather taught me was about understanding that anger and being able to channel that energy into positive action. He said anger is like electricity. It is just as powerful and just as useful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electricity and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse the energy and cause death and destruction. He suggested that I write an anger journal. He said, every time you become angry about something, don't act on it, but write it all down in your journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that is very important, because today a lot of people tell me that they have been writing an anger journal for a long time, but it hasn't really helped them, because every time they go back and read the journal, they are just reminded of the incident, and they get angry all over again. So we don't want to pour our anger out into the journal. We want to write the journal with the intention of finding a solution and then commit ourselves to finding a solution. I did this for many years and I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to deal with my anger constructively and positively rather than abusing it. After learning this profound lesson from grandfather, I was about 12 years old then, I decided to test him and see whether he himself had learned the lesson or not. And this was the time in his life when he was involved in many important things. He was um, involved in the freedom struggle of India, and at the same time he was concerned about the emancipation of the Indian women, the education of children, the emancipation of the so-called untouchable people in India. All of these issues were very important to him. And he decided to have programs in all of these different fields there. And all these programs needed to be funded. And at that time, all the funding was controlled by the British, and they were not willing to fund grandfather's programs. And so he had to find the money himself. And he realized that the easiest way for him to raise the money 
was to sell his autograph. And every morning and evening when hundreds and thousands of people came to his prayer services, most of them would seek his autograph. And he put a fee of five rupees, which in today's currency would be approximately five dollars for each autograph. And while I lived with him, it was my duty to go out into the audience and collect the autograph books and the money and bring it to him for his signature. And one day I thought to myself, well, everybody is getting his autograph, why not me? After all, I'm his grandson and I deserve an autograph too. So I got myself a little book and I slipped it into the pile because I didn't have any money. And when he came to that book, he said, why is there no money for this autograph? And I told him, because it's my book. And he said, well, you should know that I don't make an exception even for grandsons. That if you want an autograph, you will not only have to pay me for it, but you'll have to earn the money and pay me. Don't ask your parents for it. And I said, no way. He said, you are my grandfather and I'm going to make you give me this autograph free. And he laughed and said, all right, let's see who wins. <laughs> and from that day, every day, whenever he was in high level political discussions, I would barge into the room with my autograph book and thrust it in his face <laughs> and demand an autograph. My logic was that just to get rid of me, he would sign the book and give it to me. But instead, every time I became too boisterous, all he did was put his hands across my mouth, press my head against his chest, and went on talking politics. <laughs> he not only didn't give me the autograph, but he never ever told me to get out of the room and leave him alone. In fact, on many occasions, the other politicians used to get exasperated and tell grandfather, why don't you give him the autograph and be done with it? He disturbs our meetings every day. <laughs> and grandfather just laughed and said, this is a private joke between the two of us. You don't have to get involved in it. <laughs> That's when I realized that if he was able to control his anger to that extent, if we learn to control our anger, we would be able to reduce violence in our lives very substantially. Today, experts tell us that much of the violence that we experience is generated by anger. We get angry and we snap and we say things and we do things that sometimes changes the course of our lives completely. So we need to learn to manage our anger in a more constructive way. That is the first lesson in the, in the philosophy of nonviolence that all of us need to learn. And that's what he made the people who joined him in his struggle, uh, made them learn how to deal with their anger in a positive manner. But what really impressed me and continues to even impress me today was the lesson that he taught me through a little pencil a little three inch butt of a pencil became a major lesson for me. I was coming back from school one day and I had this notebook and a pencil in my hands. The pencil was about three inches long and I thought to myself, I deserve a better pencil. This is too small for me to use. And without a second thought, I just threw that pencil away because I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I went and asked grandfather for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do, he has a flashlight. <laughs> he sent me out with a flashlight to look for this pencil and I must have spent two hours 
searching for that pencil. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources and they have to live in poverty. And that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that we overconsume and throw away and destroy because we have so much of it that we don't know what to do, that every time we indulge in any of those acts, we are indulging in violence, either violence against nature or violence against humanity, but it is violence nevertheless. But to drive home this message, to make me understand it properly and make me realize the weaknesses that I had in me, he made me draw a genealogical tree of violence on the same principles as a family tree with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And passive violence is non-physical violence. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day. Things that I may have read about or things that I may have done to others or others may have done to me or whatever it was. All of that had to be analyzed and examined and put in their appropriate places on that tree. If it was the kind of violence where physical force is used, you know, like beating and kicking and slapping and punching and uh, wars and, and killings and murders and rapes and all of these things where we use physical force, that would be physical violence. But if it was the kind of violence where no physical force is used and yet you hurt people, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously. That would be passive violence. And that could be things like discrimination, name calling, teasing, looking down on people, stereotyping people, the hundreds and hundreds of things we do consciously and unconsciously, where we build walls between people. All of that is passive violence. And when I began to do this introspection, within a few months I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much because there's a limit to the amount of physical violence one can use. But the passive violence just grew endlessly. And that's when grandfather explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, consciously and unconsciously, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out that fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change that we wish to see in the world. Unless we change, we will never be able to bring peace in the world. We have to bring peace in ourselves first and then create peace outside. Peace has to be built brick by brick. It's not just going to come because we wish it. And it will come only when we change our attitudes and our behavior and our relationships with each other. 
all of which today are conditioned by violence. The culture of violence that we have created over the centuries that governs us today. It governs us to such an extent that every aspect of our lives is violent. Our language is violent, our sports has become violent, our relationships are violent, everything about us is violent. And the more violent we become, the less civilized we are. So we've got to change that. We've got to bring about that change through our own uh, understanding and growth. A lot of people, especially the young people, think that they come to the universities and colleges and schools and get education, and that that is enough um, understanding and growth for them. But that is not enough. You just get a, a certificate that you are capable of um, working somewhere. But education is a continuous process. It's a never-ending process. You have to keep learning every day of your life. From every experience that you have and every person you meet, you're constantly learning something new. And that can happen only if you have an open mind. And mind, like my grandfather used to say, that is like a room with many open windows. Let the, wind, the breeze flow in from all the windows, but refuse to be blown away by any one of them. And if we have that kind of an open mind, we will absorb good lessons from all over and enhance our own thinking and our own attitudes and grow and become more peaceful and more understanding and more respectful. A lot of people tell me that nonviolence is a very negative philosophy because it's non-violence. So I have removed the hyphen between the words non and violence. I've made it one word. It stands on its own. It's not the opposite of violence. And you'll find that for the practice of violence, we have to bring out all the worst aspects in ourselves. All the hate and the prejudice and the anger and frustration and all of these negative things have to be brought out to the surface so that we can dehumanize people and kill them and destroy them and not feel hurt by it. But to practice nonviolence, we have to bring out all the positive aspects, all the love and respect and compassion and understanding uh, that we are capable of. That has to come out and, and uh, dominate our thinking and our relationships. So nonviolence is a very positive thing. It brings out the good in us instead of the bad in us. Now this is the aspect of philosophy that we need to understand. It's not just a protest movement. It's not just uh, a political movement for political conflicts. But it is a comprehensive philosophy, a vibrant philosophy that enables us to improve our own attitudes and our own selves and truly become more loving, compassionate, respectful, and, and so on. It's because of the culture of violence that we experience today or we are controlled by today that we have all these uh, problems of social injustice. The people are living in poverty, people are living in ignorance, uh, people are marginalized, people are oppressed. All kinds of things are being done to people because we have created this kind of a society. And we don't need that kind of a society. We want a society where we can all live in peace and harmony together. So we've got to get to the point in the understanding of philosophy of nonviolence where our relationship will be based 
on, with each other on the understanding that we are all human beings and not define people by their nationalities or their color or their gender or their religion as we do today. Today we have built so many walls between people that we have forgotten that there's behind those walls there is a human being. We've got to break down all those walls. We've got to begin to look at each other as human beings. And that is when we will truly be able to create a society that is compassionate, understanding, and living in harmony. Then we will feel the pain of people who are less fortunate than us. And we will be willing to do things for them constructively. And I emphasize this word constructively because grandfather came to the conclusion that charity takes place in two forms. One that is motivated by pity and the other that is motivated by compassion. And the difference between the two is that when we see somebody in distress, our immediate reaction is to give that person money and walk away from them. We are not concerned whether that money is being used properly or not, or whether that money is helping that person or not. We are not concerned about anything. We just want to do our good deed for the day, give that person the money and go away from there and be done with it. That is acting out of pity. We pity that person and give that person some help and, uh, and walk away from it. But if we were to act out of compassion, then we would stop to look at that person and talk with that person and find out why is that person suffering this distress? What is wrong? What is happening in that person's life that makes it impossible for that person to stand on his or her own feet? And then try to help that person realize their potential. And stand on their own feet. And that is constructive. That is where we are rebuilding the person's self-respect and self-confidence, which have been crushed by the oppression that that person has suffered. And that helps the person more than just giving that person money and making that person dependent on, on uh, charity all the time. Now, the, this can be done only if we have that kind of compassion and understanding and willingness to make sacrifices. We would have to sacrifice our time, sacrifice a little comfort, and do these things. I am speaking out of uh, experience. When I was living in India for 30 years and working as a journalist, I saw a lot of poverty, unimaginable poverty in, in India, where people, whole families were living on the sidewalks in the streets of Bombay, millions of them. And I thought to myself, and I spoke with some of my friends in, the, in, in journalism, can we not do something to change this? And I said, let's experiment with grandfather's philosophy which was constructive action. Uh, it, it was um, trusteeship and constructive action. And what he meant by trusteeship is that each one of us has a talent, a talent that we have acquired through our education or a talent that we in, uh, inherit. But we think that we own the talent and therefore we exploit that talent for our own benefit to achieve whatever our ambition may be. But grandfather said we don't own the talent. We are trustees of the talent. And as trustees of the talent, we should be willing to use the talent for other people as much as we use for ourselves. And that means 
constructively or constructive action. So we did this. We brought together about 600 people living on the sidewalks in unimaginable poverty. They had no hope and no uh, means of getting out of that cycle of poverty. For months, we sat with them and talked with them and tried to build a bridge with them, tried to reach an understanding out of humility. We couldn't go there and tell them, look, we know what your problem is. You just follow us and we will help you. That is not possible because we really don't know what the problem is. We have never lived in those circumstances. We don't know what the problem is. So it's very important for us to have that humility to go there and sit with them and try to learn from them what their problems are and how do we um, resolve the issues that are involved. In. We did this for many months and we came to the conclusion that they needed an economic base and they needed um, uh, something that they could create themselves there. One common factor that existed in many of them was that they had at one time or the other been involved in the handloom industry, making textile cloth by hand operated machines. But when the textile mill, mills came in and the modernization and all that, they were run out of business and, and they forgot how to do that work. So we said, okay, we are going to try to develop this. And what we did with them, we didn't go to a foundation and get the money and create a, a business for them. We told them that we want to do this for you, but you are going to create a fund by saving a coin every day. And only when you have enough money that we will build something for you. Now this was a tremendous challenge for them. People who didn't know where their next meal was coming from, to expect them to save a coin every day was something tremendous. People laughed at us and they said, how do you expect them to do it? And we said, frankly, we didn't know how to, they were going to do it, but they had to do it. They had to be a part of the pro a solution because they were a part of the problem. We told them, you have to work extra hours, you work extra hours, if you have to save it by cutting down on something, if you smoke, give up smoking, if you drink three cups of tea a day, cut it down to two cups of tea a day, whatever you have to do, you decide. But save a coin every day and come back to us when you have enough. They came back a year and a half, and this was in 1970. By the end of 1971, they came back to us with the equivalent of $11,000. And with that, we bought them 10 secondhand textile machines and installed those machines in a little tin shed in one of their villages and sent back about 80 people to run that factory round the clock so that it, they can make it profitable and make it possible for all the people who had contributed them to the fund to come and live on the earnings of the factory. Now they didn't know anything about money management or marketing or production or any of these things. We had to help them. We had to help them and teach them. And when they became confident enough to take over, we handed over charge to them. And today I'm very proud to say that those people have expanded their businesses to six factories with total of nearly 700 machines. And not only the initial people who had uh, contributed to the fund, but many more than them have come back and, and living a better life and uh, their children are now going to schools and colleges and they have come back as teachers and managers and, uh, and they have provided the infrastructure that they needed. 
Now what we did there was to rebuild their self-respect and self-confidence, make them realize that they could do things for themselves. They didn't have to depend on charity. They just needed a little helping hand and we gave them that helping hand. Now that is constructive. But just creating something and handing it over to people that here run this doesn't work very well because they are not invested in that. They get the mindset that we don't have to work hard. We just ask them for things and they will produce it for us. And that is not the kind of thing that we want people to uh, believe in. We want people to stand up and, and count for themselves. And so the concept of trusteeship and constructive action is a very important pa part of the philosophy of nonviolence, which many people or many scholars have totally ignored. They don't even mention it. But these are aspects that we all need to remember. That nonviolence, first of all, helps us to improve ourselves, to be become better human beings. It helps us to constructively develop society and help others so that they can um, be um, contributing human beings. And it helps us to get social justice through protests and, and nonviolent uh, struggles. So this is the thing about nonviolence that we need to remember and, and learn more about and, and uh, practice in our lives. I want to end with one last story, a story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came there and did their best, but nobody could satisfy the king. And one day there was a intellectual from another town who came on a visit and he stopped to pay homage to the king and the king asked him the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. So the next day, the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house and came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course, the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace. And he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace. And every morning he would open the gold box and look for an answer and he couldn't find any answers. So a few days later, when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain. He said, you sent me to the sage and he gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what a grain of wheat has to do with peace. So please explain. And that's when this intellectual said, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish and that will be the end of the story. But if you had allowed this grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if somebody has found peace and they keep it locked up in their hearts for their own personal gains, it would perish with them. But if you let it interact, it would sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I have come here this evening to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather. And I hope that you won't let it rot and perish, but let it interact so that all of us together
can transform this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you. We're going to move to the table over here. <clears throat> we are going to now open the floor for questions and answers from the audience. We ask that you would limit your, uh, your questions to one question for our speaker, and um, we're going to ask you, too, because we do not have um, microphones in the aisles, that you project your voices as loudly and clearly as possible. So we now want to open up the floor for Q&A. Yes. Was the question exactly? Okay. Could the you, passing? you know what, if you could come a little bit forward and just repeat your question, please. Well, nonviolence is not a passive uh, philosophy. It's a very active philosophy. Um, you don't let people take advantage of you, but you don't act aggressively against those who try to take advantage. You try to educate them and, and change them. But it's a very active philosophy. It's not, uh, not being a doormat and letting people walk all, o all over you. Yes. Um, sorry, I'll come on. I was in uh, Bombay, staying in Bombay this last summer break, and at the same time I was reading uh, Pim Swaraj, Mahamagandhi's great uh, work mm -hmm. on um, Indian Home Rule, and uh, that was a very discordant experience because Gandhi speaks very actively against what we call modern civilization, industrialization, and a lot of that, and, and living in an Indian city with Coke and Pepsi billboards over every storefront, it was um, deeply disturbing. And I guess, I guess my question is, I often feel that in modern reiterations of Gandhi's philosophy, those more radical anti-capitalist sentiments get very swept under the rug and don't get talked about very much. I think he was, it, from my reading, categorically against a lot of the institutions of modern capitalism that are very ingrained in modern India and, and across the world. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, wondering what place that part of Gandhi's philosophy had in modern civilization, what we can do with it, um, how we can turn it into something other than despair, because that's what I feel a lot. Um, it's what I felt a lot reading into Swaraj and modern Bombay. Uh, yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, explain that modern India abandoned Gandhi's philosophy at the time of independence. Uh, once independence was assured, uh, the politicians uh, abandoned grandfather and his philosophy, and they openly told him that this is as far as we are coming with you, and from now on, you go your way and we are going our way. And so modern India has not been practicing nonviolence at all. And the other thing, of course, I ne uh, we need to remember that any philosophy should not be accepted dogmatically. Um, it has to be vibrant, it has to be ever-changing, it has to be uh, more uh, uh, conducive to the circumstances today. Uh, Gandhi wrote the Hind Swaraj 
uh, way back in the uh, early um, 1900s, uh, 1906 or 1907 or something. Now, those were his feelings at that moment that he expressed in that book. But we can't accept everything dogmatically and say that that would stand true today also. Uh, it has to evolve, and, and, uh, but evolve sensibly, uh, not take it totally out of context and, uh, and you know, create something absolutely new. So these two things that we need to remember in, in that uh, practice. Yes. Um, just the story you told about alleviating poverty of the textile workers seems to be very much connected to addressing issues of uh, institutionalized economic inequality. And that for me brings up the uh, current debate in the United States with Occupy Wall Street and similar issues. What do you see as the role of Donald Trump? I see a very important role for nonviolence, and I'm very happy that the people involved in the Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street movement are nonviolent and are practicing uh, the philosophy. Um, the only concern I have uh, is uh, that they have made, or at least the media has made, um, known to everybody what they are against. But we have not made known to people what they are for. And a movement has to stand for something and not just be against everything. So I, I think uh, it's about time that they work on explaining to the people what they are standing for, what do they want. Um, I, I object to Wall Street. I object to the greed that is going on. and and the materialism. In fact, my grandfather used to say that materialism and morality have an inverse relationship. When one increases, the other decreases. And we see this happening all the time. The more materialistic we are, the less moral we become. And um, so we need to find a balance between materialism and morality. And that is something that uh, the Occupy Wall Street people should be promoting, that we want a balance. We don't want to destroy Wall Street. We don't want to destroy the structure, but we want a balance, and, and we want uh, more compassion uh, from uh, the, the rich people. In there. So, you know, these are some things that we need to remember. Yes. And then two others. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think so. I know Gandhi said that he got this philosophy out of the scriptures, uh, Christian scriptures, Hindu scriptures, Islamic scriptures. He brought it out from there and uh, practiced it. It's not something that he created himself. So it's you know quite possible that we find uh, the same thing said in scriptures that Gandhi said. Uh, let's see, a couple questions. One right here on the end, and then this hand, and then this hand at the toward the front. Yes, go ahead. Violence in which system? Our food system and the treatment of animals and the violence in our culture. Yes, indeed. I mean, we have become so violent, as I said in my talk, uh, that every aspect of our lives has become violent. So we are not only violent with each other, but we are violent with animals, we are violent with nature, we are violent with everything. 
we are very destructive. And we need to change that attitude and become more uh, compassionate and understanding. In the rear, and then the questioner up here. Yes. Uh, thanks very much for speaking. And uh, I think just for myself as a young person, a lot of us come here with uh, good intentions and we want to be peacemakers in the world. But myself included, I have trouble figuring out my own major. And, you know, we, a lot of us just get wrapped up in how busy we are. And when we graduate, we get wrapped up in a job. All of a sudden, the good intentions look less economical and kind of go by the wayside. I'm wondering what your advice is to a room full of young people who are looking and who are, you know, hold potential to be you know, the next generation of peacemakers. Where do we put our boots on the ground? What steps do we take? to make ourselves agents for peace? Well, I can't give you a formula for this because everybody has different uh, problems and difficulties and, and so each one of us has to come to terms with that and, and decide how we can or what we can do uh, to bring about peace there. We can do little things, we can do big things depending on our capacities there. Uh, I was at a school in uh, Portland, Oregon. It was a middle school. And I spoke about the poor children uh, in India who were being exploited and uh, had to work when they were four and five years old to uh, get a meal to eat. And uh, how we had established this institution to uh, help them get out of that poverty and, and uh, you know, we built the first school uh, in, in India. Uh, if anybody is interested, they need to go to gandhiforchildren.org and you'll get all the information about the work that we are doing with exploited children. But uh, when I spoke to them, they said, we want to do something. Can, what can we do to help? So I told them, I said, look, all of you get pocket money every day from your parents to uh, buy something that you really don't need. You buy it simply because you have the money to buy it. And you consume it because you can buy the stuff. So suppose you were to sacrifice half of that pocket money and put it aside to create a fund and help some children somewhere in the world. Um, can you all do it? And there were about 300 children in that school. And they promised they would do it. And within six months, they sent me a check of $7,000 that they collected from their pocket money and cake sales and bake sales and all that kind of thing. So, you know, these little things can be done and they make a big difference in somebody's life somewhere. Um, we don't have to do big startling things. But we have to remember that none of us has the capacity to change the whole world. But we do have the capacity to change ourselves and help people around us change. And we should be happy to do that. But when we set ourselves goals that are impossible to achieve, that we want to change the whole world and we find that we, we can't do it, then we get frustrated and we give up altogether. So do little things, whatever you can. Uh, you know, you have to decide how much time you have and how much resources you have and how much of that you want to share with other people. There's a gentleman in the front here and then the young lady here and then the gentleman over here. If you had one piece of advice for the GOP candidates, what would it be? I think they need to get real. <laughs> um, so, so many, Gandhi talks a lot, well, you're Gandhi, but your grandfather talks a lot about um, removing yourself from evil systems and systems that are not in the spirit of truth um, as a way of bringing peace into the world. And my question would be for you is, is, is it possible to be an inside change agent? Because so many of the systems that create power in our world um, 
are not necessarily ideal systems, like the political system, going into politics, or going into you know, investment banking, you have so much ability to affect change. Um, is it possible because you're gonna have to compromise? No, it is possible. Uh, you know, we don't have to uh, um, follow people who, have, uh, who are already there and who are exploiting uh, the situation for their own personal gains. We can go there and make a difference and, uh, and change things. Uh, I worked as a journalist, as I told you, and you know, there's all kinds of things going on in journalism every day. But uh, I focused more on constructive work and, and uh, focusing on issues that affected the people and uh, made people aware of uh, how others were living and what the problems were. So, you know, we can do some constructive work being within the system. We don't have to destroy the system or we don't have to um, go against the system, but we can change it from within. There was someone over here, and then we'll pick up here, and then here. So, hi. Uh, in your, I, I read, I've read a couple of articles you write on the, uh, for the Washington Post, and I was just wondering, you, you said your grand, uh, grandfather established the theory that with, with religion, it, everyone, all the faiths are heading towards the single peak. They're all going towards different ways. And then in, in your article later on, you criticized uh, uh, President Obama's visit to India when he was, uh, 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 through his vi visit to Asia when he didn't go to the Golden Temple because he had to um, cover his head uh, with a cloth and he was, uh, you know, he was afraid of uh, losing the vote bank here. So I was just wondering if you could explain a little more about, um, and you, when, you, when you criticize America of gaining materialistic superiority but lacking uh, some of the the, the points which you just laid down in your lecture, what do you think is the, is the right, is, is the way forward to go from there? And what do you think the way so far we have headed to is, 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 is the right path uh, for us? I don't remember writing anything about President Obama. <laughs> I don't know, you m probably misread because I haven't written about that issue at all. Um, but I, uh, you know, I believe in uh, interfaith. I believe in the unity of all the religions, uh, and I, I've always professed um, respect for all different religions. My brand of secularism doesn't mean that we uh, deny our own religion or give up our own religion to accept something else. I believe that uh, we can learn to respect all the religions just as much as we respect our own. And that is all that uh, we need to do. But, uh, you know, people have uh, all kinds of concepts. And uh, so I've been trying through my blog in the Washington Post to uh, bring about an awareness of uh, these attitudes. Um, change is necessary in order to achieve nonviolence, personal change. And you're talking about teaching and teaching people about the philosophy of nonviolence. Um, but that's definitely going to pose a challenge because people have such strong held beliefs, beliefs that they maybe um, gain from experience or tradition or what they've been taught previously. And I, it's hard to tell somebody that you're teaching them something that is right. So how do you teach nonviolence or teach your philosophy in a way that may be receptive to what they've previously learned or in a way that it's something that you're both experiencing as opposed to teaching? Well, that's why I, um, whatever I've said today, I've said from my personal experience. And uh, I'm te teaching people through my personal experience. I'm not telling them that that is the right thing. I don't. Uh, I, I want all of you to reflect on what I've said and accept what, uh, what you think is right uh, in what I have said. Uh, I'm not suggesting to anybody that they accept everything uh, you know, as gospel. 
Uh, but these, those were my um, experiences, these were my uh, lessons that I learned and uh, I shared them for what they are worth. Yes. Well, I think um, relationships is a very important aspect of the philosophy. Uh, we need to build relationships that are based on respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. Uh, instead, we build relationships that are based on self-interest. Uh, you know, if we uh, are going to gain something from this relationship, then we have it. Otherwise, we d are not interested in the relationship. Uh, these are some of the negative aspects of relationships. We need to build better relationships. And if we have that kind of uh, good relationships that are based on mutual respect and understanding, then we can reach out to people and, uh, and be helpful without being uh, condescending. Um, we, we need to be more humble in the way we approach people and, and tell them we, we should not go there with that superiority and they say, uh, you take this from us, we are giving you this in charity or, or something like that, but it has to be more uh, coming from the heart, uh, you know, uh, and that comes out of humility. The role of the state. Uh -huh. Well, I think in the pursuit of justice, everybody has to play a very significant role. Uh, people who are uh, statesmen, or people who are leaders, or people who are common people. You know, one thing that my grandfather used to say that nobody oppresses us more than we oppress ourselves. Uh, when we accept the situation as it is and just abide by everything, then uh, we deserve what we get there. Uh, recently, Howard Zinn said that the problem with humanity today is uh, that they are, you know, it's not civil disobedience that they believe in, but civil obedience. And we have been so obedient that we accept wars and starvation and hunger and and injustice and everything, um, you know, quietly without uh, raising a voice there. So we need to wake up and, uh, and um, make people aware that we are not going to accept this kind of uh, injustice uh, of any kind in anywhere. One last question. How do we learn humility? Is it enough to keep a journal to notice the violence outside of you and inside of you? Or is there something more you have to do to actually learn how to be humble, to learn not to judge people? I think humility and ego uh, go hand in hand. Uh, the more ego we have, the more uh, aggressive we become. Uh, so to be humble, we have to suppress our egos. And uh, it's only through suppressing our ego that we can learn to be humble and humil uh, 
practice humility. I want to thank uh, Arun Gandhi for his wonderful talk and his time of sharing with us. Let's give him another hand. And as we close our program tonight, we wanted to let you know that, there, that uh, Mr. Gandhi will be here signing books, uh, a book that he authored called Legacy of Love and Ed Education in the Path, My Education in the Path of Nonviolence. There are refreshments at the rear of the chapel. And we thank all of you for coming out tonight in such wonderful numbers to be with us this evening. Thank you and have a good evening.